feels good to have the full power of the voice again. Yo, we're back. It's the Overreaction Monday show here on Orange Bloods Live. I'm Jeff Ketchum. That's uh, not Chad Hastings. It's Anwar Richardson and Alex Dunlap. It's like muscle memory. The words just come out of my mouth. Guys, glad to be with you. Uh, everybody that enters the Specs chat, do us a solid. Hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel. Get notifications. Just chop them down. All of them. Do all three things. You'll make us incredibly happy. Uh, a lot of stuff to get into today. The Longhorn scrimmaged on Saturday. Uh, they had a big recruiting event, a monster recruiting event. We may not talk too much about that over the course of the next hour, but we'll have shows on Orange Bloods Live all day long talking about all of the things. We'll probably get into some Tavondre sweat. Yeah, that happened over the weekend. So uh, oh, Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. Today. Oh, it's there's an eclipse today. I've got to make sure when this show's over that I remember to take the glasses up to the school because we were halfway to the school today. And I asked the kids, you have your glasses. It's your mom like has been stressed. Y'all school didn't get canceled, catch? What's that? Y'all school didn't get canceled? For what? I don't know. They canceled it out here. They called a state of emergency. So they canceled school. What? I don't even know what to say about that. But no, <laughs> spring ISD did not. Shut down classes. Did, did they not cancel where you live on more? No. The, the parents are supposed to show up. I feel bad because I'm not going. Do you yeah. know that if they'd called off school today, Anwar would have already riffed on that? Like, do you know <laughs> what this school district is making me do on a Monday? Are you kidding? No, it's well, I, I think it's just because where where I live, this school like they like 71 is where how, how everybody's going out west to the spots where you can get like view a really long time. And so they said they're worried about. I mean, they're just lying. They're, they're, they're worried about crowds. They're saying it's traffic and stuff. Is they, they, so they declared state of state I of saw emergency. one video this weekend where they <laughs> asked a a plane full of people headed to Arkansas, how many of them were going to Arkansas to view the eclipse, and every person on the airplane raised their hand. I don't what? know what's going on. I'll find that video and send it. <laughs> it was pretty bananas. I was just. And I started thinking about it. I was like, why else would you go to Arkansas unless you're John Calipari? We won't get into that, I don't think, <laughs> during today's show. Guys, let's just jump into the scrimmage discussion from Saturday. A number of hot takes emerged from Saturday. Onward, I got to admit, I didn't think that that's where my brain was going to go going into the weekend. But on Monday, today, I've got some hot takes. Oh. Um, Let's recap real quick. On war, I'll tell you what. You recap the scrimmage from your front. Okay. And then I'll add on a few notes. And Alex, I don't think you have to worry. Colin Simmons will get mentioned, so we're good. Uh, and then we'll just hop into it with this team's now less than two weeks away from the spring game. You can start to draw some conclusions, I think, about areas of the team. Let's start with a few notes. Well, they, uh, you know, apparently there were more live periods catch on, on Saturday um, is what I heard and, and um, than previously. And, you know, I heard it was, it was spirited practice, a good practice from what it was described to me, scrimmage rather, a good scrimmage overall from what it was described to me uh, within those uh, live periods. Um, <laughs> one of the first names I heard catch. 88 is great. I don't know where where is Sorrell because where's Papa Sorrell because I hadn't heard that name throughout most of the of of camp, at least spring camp. And one person, I'll start there, uh, just told me that he was killing it on on Saturday. Told me that he was, you know, Baron Sorrell was able to get to the quarterback uh, a lot and had a, a, a huge impact. So his presence. Uh, was felt his dad will join us probably 30 minutes too late and be like 88 is great and you're like dude we just talked about him like you missed it go back uh, to the beginning yeah <laughs> exactly uh so we we, we had that um i did ask i said once i heard about you know you know 88 then i was like well what about trey moore like um how you know how did he look out there and one person just told me they just didn't notice him you know on that particular day so um does it Obviously, that's not an overreaction Monday. It just means that you know, he wasn't necessarily noticed as much as Sorrell was. Um, I know you'll probably talk about this a little bit more on the noon show, but Jaden Blue continues to be the name that I hear uh, more so than C.J. Bassett. It was like, yes, yeah, C.J. is good. 
but Jaden Blue just ripped off explosive run after run. Um, and he just seems to be the guy that has all the momentum in the world. What does that mean for as far as RB1 versus RB2? Probably not much, but Jaden Blue is the guy that, I, that I've heard a lot. Um, you want me to keep going, uh, Catch, or you want to stop there? Well, I'll, I'll add this, and then we can okay. just kind of hop into some discussion. I probably talked to like a dozen people, or I didn't talk. It was weird. I heard interviews with like 20 prospects. And inside every single one of those interviews, uh, our guy, we had some freelance guys working for us this weekend. They asked them, hey, like anybody stand out at the practice? What did you think of the scrimmage? What were your thoughts on practice? So I heard like 20 different guys give an answer to that question. And every answer was different, but there was some consensus. If you can gain a consensus from 20 high school football prospects, in addition to other people that I was able to communicate with that were at, at the scrimmage, uh, felt like the defense won the day. One guy, one guy told me he the best thing he loved about the scrimmage, it might have been Zion Williams. I have to go back and look at the notes. Uh, the defensive tackle from Lufkin, who is funny, man. I may have to put the audio clip up later of him discussing how much food he ate on Saturday, but that kid's going to have to go to the bathroom for like an hour at some point. Maybe he already has. Um, they love the fact that there was the, the teams were, it was chippy. I heard that it was really competitive. Um, and a lot of the young prospects liked that because they felt like they could see that there was a brotherhood. That was one word used where the team was highly competitive, but very encouraging. It wasn't as if there were sides and it all felt like they were all trying to make each other better. But the consensus seemed to be that the defense won the day. Uh, one guy mentioned that they backed up the, the smack talk. Um, Jaden Blue mentioned by a half dozen guys on war. Mm. Uh, it was he may have been the most mentioned player, offense and defense, uh, mentioning Jaden Blue. Uh, Ryan Wingo was noticed by DeCorey and Moore, which is interesting because Ryan Wingo didn't really have a big scrimmage. Um, mm -hmm. The two big plays on offense were made by the tight ends, Nye Black and um, oh gosh, I'm I'm uh, I'm having a fill in the blank for me, Alex. No, thank you, Gunner Helm. I just. That name just escaped me. Uh, though they probably had the two biggest plays on offense, but DeCorey Moore was like, Ryan Wingo is big and fast and athletic. And holy cow, I'd never seen that guy in person before, but he's really impressive. Um, the defense just got a lot of love. It sounds like Colin Simmons had a couple of sacks. I know Anthony Hill stripped CJ Baxter of a ball. The secondary wasn't letting guys get open. So add a boy to the Texas defense because they really made an impression on a number of prospects that were on hand. Um, and the general vibe was that it was their day. And it was, oh, I have to go back and look through my notes. I can't, because I listened to 20, I can't quite remember and associate every quote. I want to say it might have been um, the running back, Racine Guillory, who told me, going into practice, the Texas commitment from 2026, that he had been hearing that the offense had been kind of getting the better of the defense going into the scrimmage, that that was what he was being told was generally happening. Uh, and he said, but that didn't happen on Saturday, that the defense did the damn thing other than Jaden Blue, which I don't, I didn't see it. I don't know exactly what he did, but everybody was talking about Jaden Blue. So, uh, Alex, I'll come to you first. Any singular big hot take you're itching to get off your chest on a Monday? It's an overreaction Monday show brought to you by Rogue Shop. And I will give Rogue their love here in just a moment after forgetting to do so at the top of the video. Your big hot take on a Monday, Alex. Well, you said, I mean, you said, you, like, the only thing I got from anybody was about the Colin Simmons stuff. And he had the, he had, Colin Simmons had two sacks and a fumble recovery. Um, you know, is here's here's something that feels like it's kind of become a little bit of a hot take. Am, am, am I getting like echo from one of you guys? Like yes. something. Okay. Um, something that's becoming like a little bit of a hot take. 
recently with how he's been d- deployed. But like, if we just said this before the spring started, it wouldn't have been a hot take at all. And that is just like, wh- who's to say that Colin Simmons can't just come on like gangbusters and end up like being a starter by the time that the season starts? <laughs> who's mm. to say that he couldn't do that? That's a hot take. What? I think it's a little bit of a hot take. Yeah, well, but yeah, well, you asked if it's a hot. You, no, you asked I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm, I'm giving saying, you a volleyball class. But, I like but, it. What I'm saying, what I'm saying is, <laughs> it wouldn't have been a hot take if we would have said it's pre-spring. You know what I, I mean? Don't know. Like he's he's Colin Simmons. Yeah. On some level, don't Texas fans think every five star is going to start? Yeah, as a freshman. Yeah, I mean, it. Well, I mean, the fact of the matter is, they already kind of have. You know, I mean, we we've heard from people behind the scenes that they kind of have the plan for Colin Simmons and Omar and I've talked about it on, on the show before, but it's an Anthony Hill like plan, right? It's one where that, you know, he's a five star. Everybody knows what, what they got in him. And they really hope that, you know, his development curve is going to be something where by the time that the season gets going, they kind of have him rolling and, you know, he, he should be a bigger part of this thing to end the season, potentially a really big part of this thing to end the season, maybe more so than he would be to start the season. I think, dude, if he stacks together, like, People said he dominated that, he, like two sacks and a, and a fumble recovery. That's a big, that's a big scrimmage, man. And if he continues to have days like that, where he's where he's noticed is like that 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 was his best, you know, practice at Texas so far. More and more of those. What's the, like what's stopping him from being like one of the stars of the defense as as early as his true freshman season? Nothing. There's no. There's there's there, there's there's nobody that is in front of him that you would say is immovable. Right. I mean, it's like oh. Kelvin Banks. You would say, OK, no, you're not. Okay, yeah. good you are. You're not yeah. starting in front of that guy. Right. I mean, yeah. Quinn Ewers, he, 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 yeah, Arch may be really good in the future. Uh, you're not starting in front of that guy. But I don't think from that position, Alex, that you can say put anybody in front of him like <laughs> you're, you're you're biting off more than you can chew. Like, I don't I don't see that at all. Anthony Hill might be the only guy that's that on that defense. Everybody no else to plant Hill, you know. It's like, yeah, there's no yeah. one to supplant him. You might be able to say like Derek Johnny Williams, Derek maybe. Williams. But I would argue that the sa- the talent at safety is such that it'll be highly competitive. I wouldn't put Williams in that Kelvin Banks, Quinn Ewers. Anthony the one thing Hill. I'd say about the Colin Simmons stuff is that he was working some third team and twos and threes for the most part on Saturday. I don't think it was he was doing it against Kelvin Banks. And I don't think he was doing it against Trevor Gooseby. So he was it no. was it was by far and away his best day of camp so far in camp, but baby steps for him. I think now he's got to do it again and, and and do it against the better players on that offensive line. Well, but yeah, but see, remember, like I didn't I didn't hear specifically whether it was versus Banks or not. Did you hear specifically that it was not versus Banks? I just was told that Simmons was working a lot against the backups. And I, one person said scout team guys. Okay. Well, I just know that that's a little bit different. I like, um, I heard he's working with the twos. Yeah. So but yeah, clearly, it's, I mean, it's like, all right. But, um, so, and, and sometimes the twos, do, so, like, they, they don't always go good on good. Like, sometimes the, it'll be the twos versus the look. It, it's impossible. <laughs> they don't. They, they don't allow us out to these things. So I think, it's, it's it's really Alex, hard. I think Colin Simmons is on the rise. I'm not trying to poo poo on it because I like the hot take. Yeah, just because of the depth, though. A lot of times, though, just so I mean, and again, not the hot take. Not to go crazy on it. Sometimes they go ones versus threes, twos versus four because of the depth that they have there. So and there I mean, was a yeah. lot of mixing too. I was yeah. told. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it, but. It, <laughs> it's not like we're you're over, you're selling some guy who's like you know like a walk on. I don't want to throw a stray at anybody. I was about to name a name, and then that felt like that would be kind of horrible. Good job. I was about to. It's not like you're gonna no, but it's not like that. Like we, you know, we. I think we understand who we're talking about. I will say this: it's cool that Colin Simmons had a moment like that because I don't think <laughs> they had come with great frequency. So Saturday. <laughs> I told you. Hey, on the porch, go back to minute four, like 10, 11 minutes ago. We were given 88 love, L O V E, first name out of Anwar's mouth about yeah. the scrimmage report from Saturday. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the last two weeks of camp look like for Simmons. Because you would expect that he's, that 
there's going to be a light switch, Alex, that flips on. I think the, the for me, the bigger thing for Saturday was, did he flick that light switch on a little bit? Are we going to start in the next four or five practices? Are we going to hear his name a couple of times? And like, man, he just keeps coming on because then it really gives you some thought about where he might be in August and how much of a first day impact guy he might just be. Yeah, man, it's it, that's the thing. It's like, well, it's about stacking days like that, right? Exactly. You can't just have a day like you can't just have a day like that, and just I mean that just changes everything. You you have to stack days like that. Anwar, give me a hot take. Oh, okay. Let me. All right, all right. There's a hot take, which is I have to bite my tongue because Catch is saving this topic for for his noon show. So no, <laughs> go for it. No, 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 no. You trust me. I got it all in my head. We'll be good. I, you want my hot take? Yes. You want my hot take. I think Jaden Blue should be RB one. That's my hot take. That's my hot take. That 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 that's my hot take. I think Jaden Blue should be RB one. And I know Steve Sarkeesian. Steve Sarkeesian gave us CJ Baxter uh, to the media last week. He gave us Baxter and Hill. And I and that is always the just so you guys know, this is my number one guy, right? I, and I get it. And I get it, but I catch. I just feel like Jaden Blue has been more explosive. I I don't and 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 I, I feel like he's been more dynamic. I I know that they say C.J. Baxter is violent, and I get all that. But if you're talking RB one for me, which is my team, which is not, if Steve Sarkeesian cared about much my opinion, which he doesn't. Um, I go Jaden Blue. Jay so RB one for me. I am. Uh, we are going to be talking about this more on House Divided today for sure. Because I wrote a little bit about this. You know, I had we had. I've been thinking that one and two, Alex, at the running back position, it, it's Blue and Baxter. And I feel like if you look at the usage rate, last four games of the season, Baxter had a little bit of a uh, extra touches than Blue, but. The carries were roughly the same. Blue had more in the receiving game. They were inter- mixing those guys in pretty evenly. So going into camp, I just haven't thought much about the starting running back battle. And there's been a whole lot of Trey Wisner has been looking good. And Christian Clark has been looking good. And we've even had some Jarrett Gibson and Christian Clark. Like first half of camp, there was a lot of backup running back talk. And yet what occurred to me on Saturday – was that anytime anybody this spring has mentioned the starting running backs, Jaden Blue's the guy they mentioned. And on Saturday, like I said, I spoke with at least a half dozen guys, offense and defense, who were like, Jaden Blue is a bad boy. I was like, okay, you know, hey, who's the guy that stood out to you today at practice? Jaden Blue, Jaden Blue, Jaden Blue. I thought, God damn, forgot. If the defense won the scrimmage, what did Blue do? That had everybody talking about him like that. Mm. Then I just start thinking about it, and I was like, man, you know what I have not heard a lot of throughout the last couple of weeks? I've not had anybody come up to me and say, CJ Baxter is a bad dude. It's always blue. And on war, I don't even know how scorching of a take that is. It probably is to the coaching staff and Steve Sarkeesian and to Shard Choice. But Alex, I... Jaden Blue is like a buzzword coming in out of his camp, I think. And I wonder how long, you know, because that was going to be a Brooks-Baxter timeshare last year, the way it started the first couple of games until Baxter missed a game and then Brooks just never gave the job back up. I do wonder if Sarkeesian can live in a world where Blue's getting two-to-one touches Versus Baxter. Well, I mean, first, uh, I have a couple things to say about this. First thing, Baxter's vision needs to get better than it was last year. I mean, it just it just does. Um, his his ability to, to to navigate through the zone lanes just needs to, he needs to be more more decisive. And there was a there was a real drop off with that. Whenever you see JB come out of games and you would see um, you would see Baxter go in, you even saw a drop off from like Trey Trey Wisner and Blue and them as far as like the vision was concerned. But he did say at the availability on Thursday that he felt like his freshman year at Texas reminded him a ton of his freshman year at 
whatever high school. Where do you go to high school? Florida. Edgewater. Yeah. Edgewater yeah. High School in or in or out, it's in Orlando. He had some dude ahead of him there who ended up being like he was like some kind of all state Florida guy, like really big local dude, but um, he just got a scholarship to like Coastal Carolina, but it, he was still a dude who CJ Baxter was like, I felt like I was behind a super awesome guy my freshman year in high school. And I feel like I'm coming into my sophomore year where I'm kind of taking that step into being the guy and stuff. The fact that he was even in the fact that was, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm more, that's the first time you guys got to address Anthony Hill, right? Yes. As, as far as media. Yeah, so, Hill, or, Hill or Baxter. Yeah, right. So whenever they bring in the star defensive guy, it feels like they're bringing in the star, you know, the star offensive guy that you guys haven't been able to get before. And when Bianco brings those dudes and serves them up, he generally serves up the dudes that, I mean, that he figures maybe the staff would want to, you know, the ones that just kind of speak for the program and stuff like that, right? Does that seem – does, does I, would, seem I, would, I, would, I would say it works the opposite. I would say Sarkeesian gets to choose the guys who, uh, who will speak more so than uh, Bianco having that say. Okay. Bianco provides them. Sark chooses them. Um, but it goes even I, more to the point. I it's think more of, it's more of the right. Yeah. It's more of the, uh, I think, uh, I think it says to what catch is saying, I think it's kind of the same thing. Like it's just the guys that they are offered up to us, whether they're chose by Sark or B Bianco, I'm, 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 I'm sure you're right about that. Right. But doesn't it feel like those are the guys that they like? Oh yeah. That's that stamp of approval. Yeah, maybe on right. red wasn't wasn't offered up this week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so you know, there's 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 that right. So so far, I think Baxter's vision needs to get better. He needs to be better, just making his one decisive cut and and, and inside, especially outside zone. Um, the staff does see, uh, seem like they appear to like him. He's saying that he's ready to take the next step, and he feels like he's in that spot where he's kind of coming into his own the same way he was coming out of his freshman year in high school, coming into his sophomore year when he really broke out. But the remaining thing is to me and catch, I didn't, uh, I haven't, I didn't look, dive into the numbers exactly in your, I was just kind of skimmed your column this morning, right before the show. But I think what you said in it, correct me if I'm wrong, is like, here's the, and this is intuitive, but you just did the, did the numbers for it. Like Sark always has a thousand yard rusher for a reason. He leans on one guy. It's like it's not like there's always been a you know a like a super uh, a, a super diluted uh, run sample with a one two punch with a three coming in all the time and stuff. Like he kind of he kind of feeds a dude right. So it's like I feel like the intention right now is is they want to come in if he's going to feed a dude for his next if he's going to keep that thousand yard back streak alive. I think you would have to put your smart money on C.J. Baxter, even though I'm with Onwar and I don't know if I'm with like I think that Jaden Blue's the more talented natural runner. I just I don't know if the I don't know if the attributes are ones that would line up for Sark to feel like he's comfortable just you know giving this dude how however many touches he needs to get to that one thousand and, and and making C.J. Baxter take a back seat. Well, it was it was it was my column. Uh, we both touched on it, but I had the details every single right. back that he had, and that's why people say things about splitting carries. And it's just like it sounds great on paper, but that's not really a Sark thing. Like if you if, did do that first two games of the season, if you go back and look at like that Alabama game, Baxter and Brooks had virtually the same number of touches. I think one had twelve and the other had thirteen. Um, in the opener, it was a little bit like that. And then again, if you go to the last four games after the Brooks injury, Brooks got hurt on 11-14, if I'm not mistaken. So every game from 11-21 on, the last four games of the year, Baxter has just a very slight edge in total touches over Blue. But in the bowl game, they basically had the same number. Big 12 championship game, basically the same number. Um, you're not wrong, Anwar. It's just interesting that there were moments last season when it definitely wasn't. It was more one to one than two to one. And I think what makes that interesting is before Brooks got hurt, Jaden Ballou hadn't had more than five touches in a single game, and then suddenly forced into it, he suddenly became a double digit touch guy the rest of the season. But you know. I wonder if Jaden Blue transfers if Jonathan Brooks doesn't get hurt. Because Blue's whole like mojo comes from that last month 
where the eyeball test was telling everybody, holy crap, like that dude is not allowed to leave. He probably would have transferled. Don't you think he got, I mean, he, he, he has a really high opinion of himself. I mean, he did, he did the whole stuff with not playing his senior year in high school. Like he's not, he's not, I don't think he's a guy who's going to, who's going to, um, you know, shirk away from any kind of controversy that would come from entering the portal and stuff. I mean, I think that that guy wants to play, so he's going to get his opportunity to play at Texas for sure. I, like I said, I, I just, the, the, I think what works against him the most is just that he, he, it's it's just it's real easy to look at Jaden Blue and look at C.J. Baxter and say like, okay, C.J. Baxter looks like the looks like the early down weapon, and Jaden Blue looks more like the change of pace. You know, it's like, and those two go together. It looks like yeah. peanut butter and jelly. It makes a lot of sense. Um, it it just might seem a little bit odd to say like, well, I got these two guys. I like C.J. Baxter a lot. They fit the two roles that I'd like them to be in. But you know what? I, I think Blue is just better all around. So I'm just going to blow up this kind of yin and yang kind of situation I have going on here just to get Blue in over Baxter. Right. I, I, I could see Sark kind of feeling that way. Anwar, I think it also isn't insignificant that if you look at last year's number and look, Baxter got twice the carries, twice the uh, receptions in the passing game. But Blue averaged 1.4 more yards per carry. He led the team in yards per carry over Jonathan Brooks by the smallest of fractions. But he still led the team. Um, and then he averages three more yards per reception than Baxter did last year. And then the sample size isn't huge, but it's enough that we can acknowledge it and say it's something. Uh, I think C.J. Baxter's got more to prove as a player, like 4.8 yards per carry as a starting running back for a power five school is unacceptable. Last year, he's a freshman. It's just, and he was injured. So you don't put. Isn't that wild that it's unacceptable though? Isn't that, it's like, if he does that, if he does that on every play, it's just, this team just goes up and down the field and scores touchdowns every, you know what I'm saying? I'm just telling you that that's below average. Uh, Yeah, I know. It's just, it's just, it's just funny to me. It's, but you're not wrong in the NFL. 4.8 will get you paid for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, In college, they like that thing to be at least over five. And, you know, if you go back and look at most elite backs that have played at Texas, their yards per carries in that six ish range. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Brooks, 6.1. Jaden Blue, 6.1. C.J. Baxter, 4.8. But we joked about it, but it's true. He is kind of Sark's boo. Sark recruited him along with Tashar Choice. They put a lot of sweat equity into that recruitment. They did not recruit some of these other. They didn't recruit Jonathan Brooks, and they didn't recruit Jaden Blue. They inherited those guys. They killed themselves to take a Mac Mm Brownism from recruiting in the state of Florida to make that happen. And uh, so I, I think that there's an instinct to ha- be like, Hey, you're our guy. We're going to feature you. This is what we told you in recruiting. And I think Jaden blue is going to have to be a little bit extra better in order to totally win that battle. Yeah, All right, I, real quick. I got, I got another hot take too, by the way. Okay. Oh, let me tell you about rogue real quick. Okay. Go for it. Our sponsor. Our badass sponsor. Where's my rogue product? I got it. Every, I got rogue product everywhere. It's just over in the corner of my desk right now. Uh, and I don't want to get up to reach for it because uh, I'm lazy. Um, go to the website, rogueshop.com. I'm looking at it right now. They got like the rotating banner for pain, stress, anxiety. Do you want to sleep better? Do you want to focus better? They've got products specifically aimed at focusing. They've got a totally baked brownie kit. Yes, they've got a 420 Rogue Shop sample pack for $16.99. There's a little bit of everything over at Rogue, including the ice cream paint job, flour. I mean, why wouldn't you? Go to the website, find out what's for you, what you want to give a shot if you've never done it before. But go today, check it out. They're orange blood supported. Richard and Shar are great people. They do great business. Leave them a Google review after they treat you really well because it helps their business grow and it helps them on the algorithms and things like that. So anyway, check out Rogue Shop. Richard, if you're out there, I hope I did you justice because we love your business. We love your sponsorship here on the Overreaction Monday show. Here's my hot take on war. I've been holding it. All right. 
I read your column on Sunday, the Sunday pulpit. If you haven't gone over to Orange Bloods and read the Sunday pulpit, I thought his lead section was really good this week. I thought it was a little bit on the crazy side, which really <laughs> made me like it even more. <laughs> but the general question was, could Quinn Ewers and this Texas offense do what Steve Sarkeesian was able to do with the 2020 Alabama offense? Can Sark do it again? Can he can he recreate one of the best offenses of all time? And inside the column, Anwar goes to great measures to kind of point out what Mac Jones did, why Mac Jones did it, what Quinn would need to do. He went through the running game. He goes through the receivers. <clears throat> is there a Devonte Smith on this team? And this is where my hot take came in. And as soon as I read that first section of Onwar's column, I was like, I know what something we're talking about today on the show. I don't think Quinn Ewers is going to be able to do the Mac Jones thing, but not because of Quinn. I think it's very po- plausible that Quinn really takes another step forward. His name was mentioned on Saturday by multiple recruits as well. I thought it was interesting because nobody mentioned Arch Manning. What is uh, the Mac Jones thing? Throwing a bunch Mac of bad interceptions like and getting your team hit? Oh, the college, so the, oh, so the college Mac Jones. Thing. The repeat 2020 yeah. Mac Got Jones. Got it. Sorry. Okay. Here's my holdup on this. On the idea that this could happen, I think – we need to reset this Texas wide receiving core and how we talk about it. I think it is insanely talented. I mean, look, I am a charter member of the John Tay Cook, uh, Cook fan club. Um, and Ryan Wingo is getting daily mentions. I mean, like they've got talent. But this group of receivers does not deserve to be spoken in the same sentence with Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell. They just don't. They're not that good. If they get there, we can we can do a show where we officially allow them to be mentioned in the same breath with Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell. But there's not a consistent player in the bunch so far. I'm a little alarmed that as a charter member of the John T. Cook fan club that the thing that I seem to be hearing most about him on a daily basis is, you know, he's got to be more consistent. He's got to catch the ball better. He's got to, he's got to bring it every day. Um, you know, Ryan Wingo's Isaiah bond. I haven't heard a whole lot about Deandre Moore and like him just blowing it up or being bad. Just he starts and he's one of the top two guys and that never changes, but I haven't heard of a receiver in this camp. that's actually having like a great camp. And Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell in a normal wide receiver year where there's not like 14 that can go in the first 40 picks or whatever it is, it's a big wide receiver class. It's unbelievable. They're legit first-round type guys. One is the fastest guy in the history of the Combine. I've heard so many people on WAR. Say and, and look, maybe Quinn elevates and maybe the numbers are close. Maybe Isaiah Bond's like a thousand yard receiver and we're just waiting for it to happen. But it hasn't happened yet. And on Saturday, those receivers couldn't get open. They didn't get open. They've had good days in camp. But on Saturday, the Texas secondary put them on lockdown and... I just don't remember that ever happening with Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell in a Texas practice. Those guys dictated terms. I I, I just think we all got to slow down with how good this receiving core is. They could be very good. Right now, Texas is taking a big step back at the wide receiver position until the light switch comes on for multiple guys in that unit. There's my hot take. Yeah, yeah, well, well, your hot take coincides with my hot take. Which was we need to hear more about Isaiah Bond. That was that that actually was my hot take, right? So you were about to say <laughs> that, that was my hot take. When I was like, I got a hot take. You're like, well, I want to say this. And then <laughs> clearly, clearly, we've been doing shows for 10 years because it, it it came full circle because I'm with you. Like, 
the we I, first of all, my take was going to be I haven't heard about Isaiah Bond doing the damn thing in any practice of scrimmage since he's been here. Just have it. I've, I've heard the opposite, quite honest with you. And I've and I've held back on some of it because I'm like, all right, maybe there's an adjustment period that needs to happen here. So I'm going to give this guy a little, some runway here. But to your point, like, I, I haven't heard about no, any kind of Debo moments. And I mean Debo Samuels. I mean the movie Friday Debo where you're just bullying a guy. And I haven't heard that from these guys as of this moment. To your point, We've heard something, you know, scatterings of Ryan Wingo, which is positive. I haven't heard John T. Cook dominating, though. I, and so there's a lot of things that we've talked about, and I think there's been a lot of plug-and-play conversation to make it seem like, all right, well, you lose Xavier, but you're going to replace him with this. You're going to lo- lose Adonai, replace him with this. And then it's like, you know, Jordan Whittington, you know, ah, that's that's an easy replacement. And it's like, well, regardless, I've heard – I know you mentioned those two, but I'll, I'll even throw Jordan in there. I've heard times when Jordan had great practices, just haven't heard it from these receivers yet. And so, yes, maybe Quinn ends up being that guy that when it's all said and done, it's, and we're just talking about this on April the 11th at 937 in the morning, it's all in, in a, inconsequential. But to your point, you would like to hear about one of those guys, especially the transfer guys that are coming in and just kicking ass and taking names. I just haven't heard that. Alex, what do you think? Well, I just think, I mean, I can't, I like, it's like, for me, it's like, well, do I believe all these sources or do I believe my lying eyes about Jonte Cook? <laughs> I mean, so it's like, I mean, I'll, I'll go with, I'll, I'll go with what my eyes have seen and understand Didn't that. Did he drop are, four passes in the first 20 minutes of a practice? I've never seen him drop four passes during. Yeah, he minutes. did. He did. You, you may have been on it. another field. I, I watched it. Look, I've, even if he does, I mean, four like drops yes like legit Jonte, you, J- J- you can ask jason sukamel he, he and i we it was we in all of our notes one day i remember reading it and going oh wow okay jason jason even had a pat uh, uh in the photo gallery he actually even i think he even posted it in our message thing but yeah that happened but that okay well, you well, just said you let's, let's, let's talk about the well, let's 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 talk about the drills at those drops because that was the thing wherever where they do the drills with coach where they where they do the drills where coach Jackson has to have them turn their whole body around to catch the stuff right and, and the and the stuff Matthew Golden was actually looking really good in those drills I did see him drop a couple of the are, are we considering those drops like the stuff in those hard catch kind of drills. I was like, talking about I, I don't, I don't think it was I mean, ever four, out of, there, four times in seven on seven or something. But, I mean, I think it's – I mean, I think we slow it down if we're just kind of <laughs> litigating the drops and what did or didn't happen. I, I just think the bottom line is the word I get on Jonte is he's got to be more consistent. And it, it, have, have they told you what that means? Is that with his blocking? It means like, he's, like he's it was good with AD one Mitchell day last? and not as good – is it, but does it have to do with his blocking? Because that was the issue last year, and that was also an issue with the inconsistencies that we heard about with with AD Mitchell last I year. I don't think the people that I was talking to were specifically thinking about his blocking. Do I think that the either of these guys is Xavier Worthy or, or Adonai Mitchell? No, I, I don't. But I think Jonte's awesome. I think he's the next big thing at Texas. And, you, you know, it's but like – But that's not the same thing. I think we all think that. I'm not getting rid of my Jonte Cook fan club – like certificate and I'm not selling any stock and there's a long time before September, but the knock on him in camp so far is that he's a little up and down that he's not consistently the same player every week. And I guess I'd point to the, the scrimmage on Saturday. He didn't do anything in the scrimmage. And we, I think we think of John T. cook as a potential future day one day two pick i mean you rank him as a five star like i did you're saying i think this guy's got first round ability coming out of high school everybody raves about his ability he still has to it's not it hasn't been in this camp add water instant superstar and on saturday there were no long plays there were no real plays that jonte cook made in the scrimmage uh that were noteworthy enough that a single player out of 20 prospects mentioned him as a guy that stood out. Now, there were guys like DeCorey and Moore who mentioned Jonte Cook 
because I think they kind of idolize Jonte Cook. Jonte Cook is viewed by the receivers in the state of Texas as a thing that they aspire to be, which is kind of interesting to hear so many guys kind of talk about him almost like he's a god. But nobody mm-hmm. said, well, you know, on Saturday he was just busting dudes up. I think t- I think people just want to see Jonte Cook every day maybe be the best player on offense that Texas has. And that's not, I think, something that people who, who I've talked with, I can't speak to, you know, and I'm not able to see any of this. Uh, but it's certainly not scrimmages and like the deeper part of practices that are the most important. Um, it's just what I'm hearing. People are saying it's the scuttlebutt. Yeah. I mean, if look, I think I've said my piece on, on John. I mean, people idolize him for a reason. <laughs> I mean, you go out, he's, he's a, he's a sick player. And if they're and if, and if they want him to be the best player on offense, what does that tell you about the way that they see him? And they see it's like what Sark says about, like, you know, like Sark's, Sark, Sark last year got got inordinately and probably unfairly pissed off at DJ Campbell because he said hey, he just gets so tilted because he looks at me. He's like, dude, I know you like I know how much better you can be. This like this pisses me off. Like whenever I see you do this, it pisses me off more because I know how much better you can be. Right. That to me, whenever I heard that, I'm like, well, that's a good thing to hear for for DJ Campbell. Right. Like we know that these things are screw ups, but you but you have the coach who's looking at him saying like, dude, it pisses me off even more with you whenever you do this. Because I, I I know the level that I could see you at. That's like if they're pushing Jonte in this kind of way, they're saying we need to be more consistent. We need to be, to, to be more consistent. To me, that says like, well, if they think that he is a guy that could be the best player on offense, what does that tell you about him? It, like it tells you that the potential is through the roof. And I don't think that, you know. It's- but everybody agrees with that. I feel like your point and the point that Anwar and I made both exist in the same universe together. That he is insanely talented and can be the number one receiver on this team, but also needs to be better day in and day out in practice to get there. I, th- I think he needs to be a better blocker. And they and they can legit, like, when they say he needs to be more consistent, they said the same thing about A.D. Mitchell being more consistent, and they didn't. And we know now, looking back, whenever the season started, it was the blocking. Like, you know, that was clear. That was something I talked about on my show all the time. I'm like, all this inconsistency stuff that we, that we heard about A.D., it wasn't it wasn't as a receiver. Look how bad he is as a blocker, man. Well, and, you I know, he got talking to people at Georgia. He got better at it during the year. People who cover that team told me that he needed to consistently catch the ball better and that – his rep at Georgia was as a guy that dropped passes. Now, oh, what's absolutely. interesting about that is the data doesn't reflect that. You can go over to Kakamami Pro Football Focus, but look at the drops while he was at Georgia. His drop rate wasn't bad. He wasn't dropping passes. It wasn't really an issue at Texas. But it was something that Georgia people told me when he arrived. The other thing is, you know, he'd already caught four touchdowns in playoff games before he got to Texas. So he was a lot more proven, I think, than than Cook, surely. But I guess some of these transfers, maybe not as much as a guy like Bond. I'm on war. I'm I'm just shocked that Bond hasn't had more buzz in this camp. Like we're sitting here talking about John I mean, We can all agree on that. The, the, like I agree with the whole discussion, except for the part where I'm just like, I just really want to be the Jason that taps the brakes and say, I'm not worried about John Tay Cook. Well, I'm not. Just, how I'm dare you time. position yourself on this show as the John Tay Cook lover and defender. I'm the original <laughs> okay. lover and defender. All right. You're I guess I'm a, stepping into the void. <laughs> you're, no, no, you're, no, you're not acknowledging. You're arguing with yourself is what you're doing. Yes. Alex. <laughs> you're literally you're, arguing with yourself. saying the same things you're saying. The, but look, Cook will at least have, people will say like, yeah, he's been, some days he's great. Some days he needs to get better. I haven't heard anything on Bond. Yeah, In man. fact, the only thing I've heard on Bond the entire camp was he got replaced on day three by Ryan Wingo when Wingo went to the ones and Cook went to the twos, and then it switched back after that. That has not anything to do with like what he's actually done. That's just what happened in terms of personnel groupings. I haven't had one person say, today's the day that Isaiah Bond showed us like what we got from Alabama. It's it's been strange this wide receiving core. Catch, I mean, I, I, one of the things that I had last week 
um, in my rep- I don't know if it was the war room or maybe been something. To- I, I don't know. But one of the things I, I I had asked around was I was like, well, you know, who who does Quinn have the best connection with so far? And I was told it was Golden. And I was like, what? And they're like, oh, yeah, him and him and Golden, they have the best connection, you know, so far. And I asked about Bond. I was like, well, what about Bond? Like, where is he in that? In that? And, uh, you know. That they just said he wasn't in the mix. I, I'll clean it. I'll clean it up. I'll clean up the uh, the cuss words for our morning show at this morning. But he just wasn't in the mix. So you know, to to me, I, that first of all, that threw me off as far as Golden was concerned. And secondly, but I think we all just assume that Bond would just be the next Adonai Mitchell coming here. And again, this is we're, we're, we're having this conversation in April. May mean nothing come September, October, November, or December, but we have to have the conversation in April. I can't just operate on blind faith because that would be kind of ignorant of us. But Bond is a guy that you would love to hear more about. But Steve Sarkeesian comes in front of the media. He knows who he's going to pump up and who he's going, who is not going to say anything about. And Ryan Wingle's name has been mentioned more than Bond. It may have been one more mention, but it's still been been a mention, you know. So, and I think that you know, so I think that has something you probably want to see more of Bond over the next two weeks. It's funny, Cotton says a couple things. Cotton, yes, you're right. Let's evaluate it the spring game. B, they're only like a little more than halfway through camp, so this we're talking about a snapshot of eight or nine practices in April. They still have six, seven ish left in camp. I've lost track of the actual number, but they got two weeks. Um, They got 15 more in August. So they got 20, they got at least 20 practices in front of the coaches before we even get to a depth chart. We're months away. It's early. However, do you see the the words written over on Laura and I's head? It's this is what we do on Mondays. It's the sh- it's literally in the title of this show. It's overreaction Monday. You got to give us one day a week where we just overreact on some stuff. Like that's what we're doing. I'm overreacting on the receivers. We overreacted a little on Colin Simmons, although maybe not. Um, we just have overreacted a little. Don't. This isn't a screaming fire in a crowded theater. This is us just talking about stuff that we're hearing at this point in camp, but we got a long ways to go on all of this stuff. And I would even point out, I think Colin Simmons on Saturday is a perfect example of this because if Simmons doesn't have the the practice on Saturday that he had, one of us could have showed up today and said, Colin Simmons might be a little overrated. Uh, overrated. He he hasn't done anything on practices yet. It could have been a perfectly cockamamie Monday hot take. Uh, but nevertheless, it's something that somebody could have said. Anwar, you're exactly right. We did have a super chat earlier. Sorry, RC, it took us a minute to get to that. We were overreacting on wide receivers. Uh, do you think Aaron Butler will have an impact this year, or do you foresee him being – the uh, latest this year's John Tay Cook, the kid is lightning in a bottle. I'm not sure he'll even be the John Tay Cook. You know, I don't think so. I think that's Ryan Wingo. Yeah, well, I think I mean, unless yeah. Wingo's even more than that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly it. Catch. Yeah. I, so I mean, if Wingo could be more than that, then maybe Aaron Butler could be the John the 11 percent snap guy. Right. What if Aaron Butler is the DeAndre Moore of this year's team? So he's thinking of the wrong wide receiver comparison mm-hmm. from a year ago. It's a guy who's not the number one freshman, but still, you know, the next guy up amongst mm-hmm. the guys in that group. Is that crazy? Yeah. I think that that's I think that's more I think that's more like it, but I don't see I I I I don't see him having a huge impact this year, but I do think he's a real talented guy, very very fast. We were having this discussion with um, well, more I forget if it was if it was with you or with Cody, but where we where we could each pick a fighter for our forty yard dash was that me and you? That there's you and Cody. 
Oh, okay. And like, um, I think that I think that Aaron Butler might be a good choice for that. If you can go to battle with one dude, oh, we did do that. Dude. Yes, we do do yeah. that. You're right. You're right. I took <laughs> I took Butler. I took Butler. I stuck yeah. Butler in there. I thought right. like like you like yeah. you took him, and I was like, oh man, that's a good choice. He's yeah. like really fast. He's 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 a good player. I don't I don't think it happens this year. It's like man, we we talk about the wide receivers and maybe some of the concerns, but look, even if the talent at the top is not as high, we can't say right now that it's as high end as Xavier Worthy and A.D. Mitchell. That wouldn't be fair to say right now. I completely agree with Catch about that. I think what we can say with clear certainty is that the depth is a lot better than it was before. Like you, I mean, it's just, it just, it just is. It's um, Wingo and, you know, Wingo, you know, guys like this, you know, um, Matthew Golden, this, all these dudes, it's, it's, it's just it's better than like Marcus Washington and stuff, right? And these so these dudes need to make friends with Quinn Ewers, yeah, and go everywhere with him this summer. Yeah. If he goes to Cabo or the Virgin Islands or China, you need to get a plane ticket. You need to go catch footballs with Quinn Ewers, because I heard Onwar report that Matthew Golden stuff, and I thought, oh man, if I'm another one of these receivers, I'm not having that. I'm gonna be his boo. Not gonna let Matthew Golden be his boo. So mm -hmm. if you are a family member to a receiver on the team, or if any of you guys are watching the show because you heard you got called out, y'all need to be with Quinn Ewers every day. Because Matthew Golden is building a rep. Don't you want to be the one that has the rep associated with? That's the guy he who he has the best chemistry with. Onwar, that shocked me in the war room. I was like, what? It shot me too. Yeah. It, it shot it shot me as well. By the way, they uh they if they if they want to hang out with Quinn, they may need to get booed up because I think him and his boo are they did some traveling right before the spring. So they bet they bet it better be a double date. You better bring someone with you and then travel with Quinn because you can't be a third wheel. You, you gotta be, be you you gotta get your girl yeah. to friend up. Yeah. So that like all, all yeah. the next thing you know, you guys are just going bowling together on the weekends, yeah. and you know you gotta be happen? you gotta be like like Shane Bouchelle and his boo and his wife. They're like super close with Mahomes and stuff like that. That's what you gotta be. If you got a real one, guys, you they will go out of their way to just make that happen. It's all for it's all part of the teamwork, uh, guys. I've got one more hot take. Is it a Tavondre Sweat related? Oh, we do we have to talk about that? I mean, Here's my hot take on Devondre. Call an Uber, dude. You just cost yourself money, and it's so needless. I, it's just we all love Devondre. We want nothing but the best for him. But that's that was stupid. And you know, I tell the same thing. I've got family members who have DWIs on their records. It was stupid, stupid. And you got, yeah, man, you got to learn from it, though, right? Thank God it didn't. Thank God she didn't. You know, it's you not get the kind one. of where you got to hurt somebody, right? Yeah, you get one, and if you don't hurt anybody, it's like, oh, well, we'll give you a mulligan on that. Do better. But if you get a second one, then you're a DWI guy. So, and, and, with, and, and, and with sweat, I'll just say this one thing. It's like, dude, he had done – it's just to me, I was just so frustrated with it because it's like, look, I don't, I'm not – I'm not here to pass judgment. I was his age at one time. Who knows how much dumb stuff I, I exactly. I, I did. Um, but I just felt disappointed for him because I was like, man, but you I didn't do it this. two weeks before the draft when you were about set to make millions at 21. And and I and I and I knew and I would have known too that this is what I knew, man. Tavondre Sweat, NFL teams worried about him being like, kind of like a partier at Texas before his senior season. In his senior season, he made it right with all these guys by saying, "Like, look, I quit drinking for the whole year. I did all the, you know, all this stuff, right? And then uh, I, I can, I can keep my weight in check. I can have my head straight. I can do all this stuff. He comes through as a great process, a great senior bull. Probably not as good of a combine as he would have hoped, but a, a good combine for a dude his size, right? Does really well in the interviews. You know, acts acts like a guy that's they're to you know they're to, they're there to show that he's all business and i began to feel like 
well, teams now like Tavondre did his job and stuff, and it's just like, man, this right before the draft, it puts all that stuff that he's worked so hard this whole time through the pre-draft process to to kind of shoo away. It just puts it all back front and center. It just it just it just stinks for him, you know. So, man, it's just that's all I have to say about it. I feel bad, for, you know, like you can't do it, but I feel bad for him, and it's like. I don't know what the best way to say it is, but it's just like it's the whole thing stinks. You can't be close to 400 pounds, which is already going to be an issue. You know, you know, the 370 ish to three. I mean, you're you're closer to 400 than you are to 300 at this point. So to be close to 400 where people are already questioning, like, OK, your 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 work ethic, your dedication to your body, blah, blah, blah. And then to have this it's just too many little things adding up where. I'm, I'm not getting, you know, a GM, you don't want to get fired for messing up a second round pick. Like well, a guy that already has some flat, like now all of a sudden it's like, all right, let me just, let's just, maybe if he's waiting, he's here in a fourth or a fifth, I'll take it. That's, that's the only thing you got to worry about. Somebody may ignore it because he is the NFL, but there's so many people out there that are like, you know what? My kids got braces and I, and, 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 you know, that, that was always <laughs> the thing. Like sometimes they would tell me, coach would tell me like, they would tell players, if I put you on the field, I am trusting you and my my kids' college tuition and in my in my kids' braces. And now you know you're like, man, is, am I going to trust this guy with my kids' braces? Like, I don't know. That's the only well, part that sucks. I um, sorry, I'm just sending a message real quick. Um, I saw Lance Zerline, former Orange Bloods writer, hmm. um, who does stuff with NFL.com, and um, you know is very close to the, that guy gets the Texans pick right almost every year. And he'll mention it like two or three days before he'll drop a little nugget and then Texans will do their draft and you'll go, Oh, he hinted about that. Like three days ago, mm-hmm. Lance is dialed in. And I've heard a lot of sweat to the Texans talk. Like it's just been something I've heard Texans fans talk about during the draft process. Zerline tweeted out last night that he wouldn't be surprised if the Texans just dump sweat from their draftable list, that he just would go into the pile of, he ain't on our draft board. And not every team, who knows? Maybe he was just talking out of pocket and the Texans won't think that way, but he's dialed in enough with the Texans that when I heard that, I was like, oh, oh. And not every team's going to have that reaction, but just a couple of weeks before the draft, you don't want to be doing anything that can hurt your stock. You just, you just want to stay out of trouble. Stay out of trouble. Don't get into trouble. It's it's bad. No no other draft prospect in the last couple of weeks that I can think of has gotten popped for the same thing. It's not like, oh, this just happens. It does just happen. And we're not crucifying Tavondre. We're rooting for him. I mean, we want him to go as early as humanly possible. But – that didn't help. Um, my last thought, and we can chew on this as much as we want to. I don't even think this is an overreaction. Texas is going to get to Corey and Moore from Duncan. Uh, it, he visited this past weekend. I, I listened to the interview yeah. that he did, about a 10-minute interview. He was one of the guys. His, his words were like, you know, I've heard – the tax that the Texas practices are a thing that they're physical and and you just he was like you just have to see it to believe it he was like these I'd heard about how hard these guys compete but they were competing hard they were talking smack but they were picking each other up and encouraging them and he was like I've never seen a practice like that before he even joked that they wouldn't be able to do that at Duncanville High School Cause like players would just be getting hurt and they would have enough guys. Like he talked about the practices in a way where it was like, Oh, so LSU doesn't practice that way. Huh? Then he answered a question about the quarterbacks where he mentioned he'd been kind of talking with KJ Lacey, but he's got to be respectful of the fact that LSU has got uh, the, the number one quarterback prospect in the country. But he, he was like, I don't care like what their rankings are. All I care about is who's first on the depth chart. And like, wherever I go, that's all that's going to matter. Like, he's going to be back on the 20th of April. He's going to be, that will make three visits to Austin in five weeks. He will take his official visit, but you could start to hear 
voluntarily, not through leading questions, that that kid's going to Texas. And it's been something I remember when Jason came back from the Under Armour event in Dallas and he was like, you know, nothing was specifically said that makes me think this, but a lot of people were talking about Texas and people close to DeCorian were saying Texas. You could hear it coming out of this weekend. He stayed an extra day so that he could meet with Sarkeesian yesterday. That doesn't just happen. And I also think they're going to get Kalik Lockett, uh, mm. Alex. So yeah. if you really want to have a big smile, uh, uh, thinking about who they may be adding to the wide receiver unit going into next season, uh, they I think they're going to get those two guys based on what I heard from them this weekend. And Jamie French is a guy that is very Micah Hudson-ish out of Florida. He came out of the weekend putting Texas into his top three, along with Ohio State and Tennessee. He wasn't saying that. In fact, if you talk to people around the nation, they would say Texas wasn't in his top five and they were just another school in his recruitment. And he came out of this weekend. And the thing is, get the sense that Moore and French and Lockett as a group were all talking about playing with K.J. Lacey and talking about playing together in college. In fact, Khalid Lockett made a point to say that he and DeCorey and Moore have been talking about playing together in college since they were in middle school. So you're starting to see that little bit of a brotherhood amongst prospects. Gosh. And I think, I think Saturday really was the beginning of Texas putting together a nationally elite recruiting class. There was just a lot of really positive things. The vibes were there. The only vibe on war that I didn't like, and it wasn't through the tone or anything else, but my guy, uh, Lamont Rogers, the offensive lineman, when he was asked who stood out in practice, mm -hmm. he mentioned the guy that is in his position, potentially uh, Trevor Gooseby. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, maybe it doesn't make a big deal. Like, you know, maybe they can start him on the right side. But when he was asked who stood out, he was like Kelvin Banks. And he didn't even know Trevor Gooseby's name. He was like, uh, the young guy. And then it was like Trevor. Oh, yeah, Trevor Gooseby. He was yeah. like, yeah, that dude looked good. And I was like, huh, I'm going to file that away because – these dudes like being told that they can come in and play right away. <laughs> and and Lamont Rogers talked about Trevor Gooseby like he knew. Don't don't just tell me Kelvin Banks is leaving next year because y'all got somebody that can play. Yeah. Well, you know, to, for, for me, Catch, and I, I, I know it's 10 o'clock, by the way, so I, I know. But just, just as FYI, um, well, for me, the DeCorian Moore stuff, I'll be honest with you, before that happened this weekend, you know, I knew how he was going to flip. When uh, Alice wasn't here that day, uh, he was taking care of some stuff. Um, when his uncle got on here, Alice wasn't here, his uncle, DeCorey Moore's uncle, got on the show in the morning. A uh, Chad was there. And basically, we did a DeCorey Moore show, and basically the uncle was letting me know like, hey, that that commitment to LSU was a soft commitment, right? And and then he started giving the, the information in the chat while on the show. And those things don't happen by accident. Like, why is this Decorian Morris uncle watching me uh, talk about his his nephew on on a random what was it Tuesday or Thursday, whatever it was? And I was just like. Well, that, that that there's no coincidence in that, right? And he was he was like, yeah, it was always a soft commitment to LSU, and that's why we're still open and blah blah blah. I'm like, oh well, he's coming to Texas. Like, if you focus, if you post, when family members start paying attention to what the people in that specific city are saying about them, their 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 family, their their athlete. All right, I already know where we're headed with this. It's Unless the same thing, with Jason kid from TCU that transferred to Nebraska. Oh, oh, um, what was dudes? Oh my god. His his mom was in on our show like just about every single except we got, for that. We got played on that one. Um well the, the, you, Nebraska back, backed up that Brinks truck at the at the end of the day. Yeah, but remember he ended up like 
I heard it was – look, I heard from an NL, NIL guy that ended up not being NIL stuff. Yeah. There was like less of a Gary Patterson thing than maybe – that was a weird one. Either way, it didn't work out really for – Nebraska or that kid. So, oh, Sean Mathis. He, he, yeah, he ended up just not being great. Uh, all right, guys, I got to go because we got a team's meeting uh, for Orange Bloods uh, and I'm holding them up and making making them wait. So, look, let's wrap this thing up. Look, we love the guys over at Rogue Shop. I said it again. Go to the website, rogueshop.com. Stress, anxiety, pain, focus, feel good. You want to sleep better. There's a little bit of everything for everybody. Get the totally baked brownie kit. Just add an egg and water and and then let it happen. Uh, or do the Rogue Shop sample pack for 420 and find out what all the fuss is all about. Either way, we appreciate them being the sponsor of the Overreaction Monday show. Hit that like button. Do it. Uh, and for myself and for Alex and for Anwar, Dolly ATX. Okay, we, I had to say and we got house, I got House Divided coming up at noon. Old Fashioned will be back tomorrow. We got the recruiting hour at four. Content all day long here and throughout the week on Orange Bloods Live. We'll see you soon. Later.